In the present paper, I will illustrate the several ways in which the concept of space is addressed in White Masks, a project developed by myself, cellist Esther Saladin, and visual artist Ines Rebello. In particular, I will describe how the project's themes, loss and transition, suggest displacement and hence the motion between different spaces. This image is realized within the project through a combination of visual and sonic elements, hence a multitude of ways that compensate for the variety of the listening per perspectives, now I'm a bit scared to say, to mention vantage points, but, um, from which the audience members have the opportunity to choose. In order to discuss the main spatial aspects of white masks, I will refer to the five space categories highlighted by Federico Macedo, the special metaphor, acoustic space, sound specialization, location, and reference. After a brief introduction to the structure and nature of white masks and to the locations the project, the project has met so far, I will point out the importance of the voices which are or become part of the project and of, of other sound sources which have been included. The following step will then be to focus on how the voices and the reverberation due to the space in which they have been recorded are used to create the idea of a transition to other spaces. Subsequently, I will describe the arrangement of the speakers and resonating objects in the performance space and its relationship to the audience and to each other. In this section, I will also specify how reverbs and echoes have been built to suggest the existence of another acoustic space. Another section of the present work will instead focus on the metal panels that have been employed within the project and on how their sizes are related to the frequency content of the sounds played through them, thanks to sound exciters attached to them. The paper will end with some considerations on how the development of the listening islands could be conceived as an alternative to the use of speakers. Um, White Masks is a project that entails an installation through which the audience is encouraged to record their contributions on loss and, transi and transition and a performance for cello, live electronics and resonating masks. The so-called masks are metal panels of different sizes to which transducers have been attached so that they act as speakers. The term mask refers to two different concepts. The first one is the one on which white mask, one of the pieces for cello solo that are performed by the cellists within the project, is based. The musical material is developed through a gra gradual filtering of the original music elements to mirror the gesture of getting rid of a mask. The second concept is bound to the process of humanization that occurs to the metal panels. The more the project is performed, the more voices it collects. These voices are resynthesized in different stages through the metal panels, which then become more and more human, hence populating the performance space with a virtual community that compensates for the loss of the community left behind. The more the variety of voices increases, the more the compensation is likely to be efficient, though unfortunately only temporary. In terms of energy or, or density, the performance has been shaped in waves. It is structured in an alternation of pieces for cello solo or cello live electronics, which result as wave crests and pieces for live electronics called intermezzi, that have been developed entirely around the pieces for cello solo and that result as wave truths. The function of the intermezzi is to enhance the ability of the audience to memorize the compositions for cello solo and build virtual spaces, as it will be illustrated. The project has been performed three times so far. The premiere was held in the Great Hall at Goldsmiths uh, in November 2016. This was supported by the, by the public engagement grant of the Institute for Musical Research, while the first steps of the project were moved thanks to the support of the Francis Chagrin Award in 2015. The Great Hall is a very big space and it has been really challenging to delineate a smaller space inside it in order to create a sense of intimacy among the audience members and the performers. Uh, you can see actually this is a picture of the Great Hall uh, during the, the installation. Um, on the other hand though, once the smaller space had been defined, it had been really effective to have all the remaining space in the hall to create an additional sense of alterity. The second performance of the project occurred in June 2017 at the Depth Hall, a public library in London. Esther Ines and I had long been looking for an opportunity to bring the project to a public space, which was more accessible than a university campus. The second performance was organized thanks to the Goldsmiths Annual Fund. The space we were allocated inside the library was ideal since it was defined on two sides by glass walls, which emphasized the opposition between being inside and being outside. 
Um, the first performance was held in July in the Pips Hall at the University of Huddersfield. The physical space occupied by the performance there basically coincided with the whole space in the hall, ex except for the stage. Uh, hence, there has not been the opportunity to, to recreate an additional opposition between here and there, besides the ones generated by the, by the sound and its spatialization. Although I've mentioned the spontaneous generation of the opposition that sometimes occurs in a venue between the performance space and the remaining space, the first set of virtual spaces that the project hosts is defined by the voices it involves. And referring to the voices that are recorded during the installation in one venue and that are partially transported to the following venues with the successive performance, but also to the voices that are steadily nested in the sound material of the intermezzi. The project has developed in an empirical way since 2015. I am specifying this because it is important to stress the fact that not all the special aspects and implications of the project were clear since the very beginning. What MASKS has developed and is developing because it, it can be considered as in a constant state of work in progress. This is certainly due to the fact that I am based in London, Esther is based in Frankfurt, and that the collaboration with the visual artists only started in a second stage of its development, but also to the intrinsic, intrinsic nature of the project that aims to gradually integrate the voices of the audiences it meets. Since we were planning to perform the project in the UK and Germany, Esther and I decided to record texts by Franz Fanon and Samuel Beckett in English and in German. Uh, when I received the recordings and had to start working on them, I found out that they were uh, noisy and heavily affected by the strong reverberation of the space in which they had been made. Uh, instead of fighting against this aspect, I decided to highlight it so that it would refer to another space. And I'll, I'll just play um, the recording that I received so that you can understand to which extent it was noisy. Um. Zum zweiten Mal. It is the most perceptible and least material. It is the archetype of the vital element. As breath is of life. Okay, now maybe you didn't hear, but there were bee, bees noises and, and yeah, other uh, noises as well. Um, so, okay. Um, the, the place where the recordings have been made is a circular building in a park in Frankfurt that can be accessed freely and that has an opening in the middle of the ceiling. It is an inside space, but birds and other noises can be heard from the inside so that it, it is also an outside space. Um, the spectrum morphology of the sounds as well has been used to re realize temporary transitions from one space to another. In Intermezzo 2, the, the envelopes of the words birth and blood, which are used in Fanon's text, are imprinted on the sound of the, of the cello. Rebecca Saunders' solitude is played silently during the whole Intermezzo, but in some brief moments it resurfaces to connect different parts of the Intermezzo. During this instance, the spectral profile of the two words is imposed on that of the cello so that the audience for a moment is invited to mentally transit from the location space where the cello has been playing shortly before to the space where the voice has been recorded. I'll play a few excerpts. Could you raise the volume, please? At the beginning, um, you could hear the, the sort of resonances of the word blood. Thank you. 
Um, yeah. In the section on the masks, I will describe further the treatments which some of the voices go through. Another sound has been used in the project to generate a reference space. That's the sound of Ambira, uh, the town piano. This sound has been chosen for both its sound properties and for the cultural association we develop when we hear it. Cera is a piece for cello, solo and live electronics that aims to transform the sound of the cello into Ambira and the voice of its player. While exploring the British Library Sound Archive, I came across Quella Chiema's song, Narioa. Since I really like the level of synthesis between Quella's voice and the sound of the mbira he plays in that recording, I decided to synthesize specific fragments of the song in which this synthesis is particularly successful. The cello, as an instrument connected to the European music tradition, is transformed into a traditional instrument that has to adapt to a European music notation uh, sorry, transform into a traditional instrument used widely in Zimbabwe and in other African countries. For once, it is not a traditional instrument that has to adapt to the European music notation, but it is a European performer who has to use improvisation and synthesize a traditional instrument. The cellist can choose when to activate the blocks corresponding to the different fragments of the song and which blocks to activate. Um, she is hence free to choose when and how to transit to the space evoked by the Mbira. In white masks, the ensemble and the arena space coincides. The arrangement of the seats is conceived so that there is space for the cellist to play in the middle of the audience. Well, not in this particular picture, but in the ones you saw before, it was uh, quite clear. Um, the arrangement of the seats is conceived yeah, it's conceived so that there is space for the cellist to play in the middle of the audience. Since the binary opposition between stage and arena space is avoided, there is also no preferential listening orientation. The chairs and stool are arranged in groups of one, two, three, or four, and they can be looking in uh, either directions. Uh, the cellist tools are arranged in two different spots, on one closer to the bigger mask and the other in a less peripheral position. In both cases, the audience can see the scores on the stands from a much more advantageous angle that usual, than usual. They become part of the visual installation, along with the stools built and a tall metal arch built by Inesh. The stools are conceived as a transition between a chair and a stool. The arch suggests a transition in itself, since it introduces a threshold. The four speakers are arranged at the corners of a square in which the seats are arranged, while the big mask, uh, the big metal panel, is positioned where the stage should be, and the smaller mask at the opposite side of the square. By combining the visual and sound elements, the audience realizes the, con of the contours of the arena uh, or ensemble space. Intermezzo 2 is characterized by a sweeping, slowly varying sound that circulates around the audience by moving from one speaker to the following one, thus clearly delineating the circumspace. The boundaries between audience, performer and composer are hence blurred. The audience's voices are being included in the performance, the composer performs through live electronics and the performer has degrees of freedom to choose when and what to play, and besides they all physically share the same space. I'll try to play the start of the second intermezzo, although it will be very delicate, I'm not sure. So this was an example, and um, this is the sound that moves around the space. Um, so uh, another combination of visual and sonic elements is realized in Intermezzo 3, 
when the voice reading Samuel Beckett's Nieder is filtered through a filter bank whose central frequencies gradually move upwards towards the frequencies corresponding to the ones retrieved from the analysis of the sound of Embira. The spectrum morphology of the sound is hence realized so that it mirrors the structure um, of the arch. I decided to realize these ascending glissandos as a special metaphor to accompany the presence of the arch, which is the only vertical object inside the arena ensemble space. Although the kind of sound diffusion the project uses at the present time does not include speakers or resonating objects in a higher position, the nature of the ascending gesture compensates for it and suggests an, ele an elevated activity so that the per perspectival space manages to be somehow extended upward. In terms of specialization, while the voice is decomposed through the filter bank and later recomposed through different speakers, the sound of the mbira is created so that the final image of the gesture, thus the mbira sound, appears as a convergence of all the glissandos. As described in detail by Trevor Richel, spatial convergence highlights timbral convergence. And I'll play a few excerpts. Mm. the second for time reasons. Um, okay. Uh, a fourth space is suggested uh, by how reverbs and echoes have been built for some sound elements. In Intermezzo 1, the material used comes from Ori Talmon's Portrait and a Dream. A recording of the piece has been compressed twice, once toward higher frequencies and the second time toward a lower register. And the timing of the musical events in the piece are intact. Since the piece is characterized by knocking sounds, the only four instances in which pitch material is produced are highlighted by the inclusion of a synthesis of them realized with the electronics from the, uh, from the frequency, um, re yeah, realized with the electronics from the frequency analysis of this instance. The compressed materials are rooted to the masks, but, but the higher material, which is obvi obviously assigned to the smaller masks, is played with a delay of little more than two seconds and hence suggesting a, a, a big space. I'll play um, an excerpt of the first intermezzo. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
So uh, in Intermezzo 3 includes fragments of Rebecca Saunders' Solitude. They are played by, far, by pair of adjacent speakers. Um, while the reverb of these excerpts is sent to the opposite pair of speakers with a delay of, of around one twenty-second of a second, which suggests a space of around 15 meters for those sitting near the speakers playing the first sound, and smaller the closer one is sitting to the reverb producing speakers. These fragments are continuously interrupted by the sound of the pre-recorded sound of the cello when playing on the sea bouts. The sound is slightly noisy and is played out of all the four speakers. Because of its imperfect nature, uh, the cello sounds are, are, are not noisy, and the choice of the outputs, it constantly recalls the attention of the, the audience to the arena space. It hence realizes abrupt, abrupt transitions between the two. At the same time, since the cellist is physically present, but she's visibly not playing, the audience associates the fragments to the performance they have just witnessed and associate the intermezzo to it, while also absorbing this, the formal structure of it. Since the alternation of the two materials follows the timing of the events in solitude, it is my intention to further develop the possibilities offered by the use of echoes and reverbs. Um, in this section, I will describe further features of the masks and discuss uh, how their sizes are suitable to resonate with frequencies corresponding to some of the formats of the vowels and peaks of the consonants. In Intermezzo 3, the recording of the voice reading back at Snyder is filtered in two different ways and routed to different speakers and masks so that one has the paradoxical impression that the same person is in two different places. In one case, the voice is filtered according to the frequencies retrieved from the analysis of the Seabout sound. Some of these are formants of the vowels and they are rooted to the smaller or bigger mask according to their ability to trigger the mask resonant modes. I, I wrote in, the, in, the, in, the, in this slide the correspondence between the size of the, of the masks and the, the formants, just to, uh, yeah, to summarize uh, the content of the slide. I will move uh, quickly uh, to the end. This is uh, uh, one of, a proposal we, we, we had developed for the Tokyo Wonder site. Uh, uh, we didn't get it in the end. But the idea is to build uh, basically um, uh, islands with, uh, with uh, multiple uh, metal panels hung uh, above uh, above uh, uh, the seats where the people uh, would sit, in order for me especially to be able to control um, the, the, the number, let's say, or, or the, the, yeah, the amount of uh, perspectives that, that the audience might have. And I guess I'm out of time, so I will have to finish here. Thank you.